Welcome everyone to the SMCI seminar series, uh, by monthly series uh, featuring both internal and external speakers. I'm Samantha Kling. I am a research scientist with the Evaluation Sciences Unit and help uh, come up with the agenda and speakers for this ongoing series. Um, First announcement we have is the next uh, seminar will be uh, March 28th. That's a Tuesday at noon, and Jack Billy will be the speaker who will present what have I learned about in about lean in healthcare. Um, so exciting uh, presentation yeah, coming up later this month. For whatever reason, it's possible. Um, and. Uh, please uh, look out for in your inbox for the announcement for that upcoming presentation. For today, I would like to offer a warm uh, welcome to Leilani Schweitzer. Um, for the past 12 years, Leilani uh, has worked in Stanford Medicine's risk management as a patient liaison. In her role, uh, she guides patients and families through Stanford's communication and resolution project. And I am so excited today to hear her presentation, who are her numbers, uh, and engage in hopefully a rich discussion at the end about the patient experience and the patient view at Stanford. And with that, I'll hand it over to Leilani. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Sam and Selena, for giving me this opportunity to um, speak with everyone today. Oh, I'm already having a little problem here. Okay. So I'm I'm an outsider to healthcare, um, or I used to be. Spreadsheets and dashboards really are not uh, something that is integral to my DNA as they may be to you. Um, my, my accountant would say I probably shouldn't even have my own checkbook. Um, I don't, I'm not skeptical of the need for data. I know it's value, but when I look at things like this, like dashboards like this, I wonder who are the green squares and who are the red squares and what are their stories? This is my son, Gabriel. Um, this photo was taken when he was about six months old. And if we were looking at a dashboard during the time when Gabriel was hospitalized, he would be one of the red squares. He died when he was 20 months old after a series of mistakes made at two separate hospitals. And how those two hospitals have responded to me has had a profound impact on my life. Gabriel was diagnosed with hydrocephalus when he was four months old. Um, a neurosurgeon placed a shunt in his brain and we had pretty normal baby raising days diapers, toys, naps, and love, until he became very suddenly very sick. In Reno, where I live and where I am right now, that hospital there treated him for, the st for a stomach bug. They never considered the likelihood that something was going on with his shunt. Um, they gave him medications that masked his neurological disorder. Eventually, I drove him over the Sierra, got him to L LPCH, and I was relieved when we arrived there. I thought, okay, now he's safe. Everything's going to be okay. The right people are going to do the right things. And Gabriel was placed on the telemetry floor, and we both were really tired. It had been a long, it had been a really long number of days. And Every time he made the slightest little bit of a wiggle, the alarms would go off. And it was absolutely impossible to sleep. I'm sure all of you are well aware of, of what those alarms are like. And the nurse, she could see how tired we both were. And so she did what seemed to be a really compassionate, patient-centered, thoughtful response. She turned off the sound of the alarm at his bedside. 
I thanked her. I really remember that quite clearly thanking her. And I immediately fell asleep until she came back in, grabbed the edge of the ugly blue recliner I was in and told me I had to wake up. And then the room filled with people and someone took me out into the hallway. This is, uh, this is my daughter, Sophia and Gabriel. This is the last photo I have of them together. Um, she's amazingly 22 years old now. My, after, after he crashed in the middle of the night, my, my memories are really pretty um, spotty. Some moments are really quite clear while the rest of the time is just, can only really be described as confusion. My brain kept looking for my sweet boy, but all my eyes saw were, was a corpse hooked to machines. And later it would be explained to me that the nurse unknowingly turned off the alarms everywhere. She didn't just turn them off next to his bed, but she turned them off there at the nurse's station and on her pager as well. And Phillips, the manufacturer of the monitors would later say they didn't think anyone would go through the effort of going through nine different screens to turn off the alarm. So they didn't include a fail safe that could have stopped her. So when Gabriel's brain herniated and his heart stopped beating, there was no sound to tell any of us what had happened. And the nurse, if we're, if we're looking again at the colors on the dashboard, the nurse's story, it should be colored red as well. And I, I think about what it must have been like for her to go back to work the next day after this happened what it was like for her to know how easily the system could fail her and how profoundly fragile it was. And I, I know a little bit about her. Um, I feel very protective of her, so I don't want to divulge much privacy about her, but I will say that she, she asked to have Gabriel move to the PICU that night. She had another patient who she was taking to who was more sick than Gabriel, uh, but she could see how sick Gabriel was, and she asked to have him moved. And for reasons that I do not know, um, she did not get that help, and they did not move her. But I will tell you, I wonder how things may have been different if, if that had been able, allowed to happen that night. After, after Gabriel died, Stanford didn't hide behind any kind of legal maneuvers. Um, they apologized, they explained, and they improved. And at the time, I had no frame of reference to see that that was really quite remarkable. I had no experience with any of this, but now I know that that kind of engagement and that kind of transparency really is quite unique and does not happen nearly as much as it could. And after Gabriel died, like it is for most patients and families, it was really important to me that as much learning and as much improvement could possibly happen from this incident. And I, I thought about what about all the other parents sitting next to their little children who are sick in hospitals? And at the time, Stanford, um, they filed a medicine report about the about the device so that everyone who else who was using these machines would know of that potential weakness. And they gave me a copy of it. I still have a copy of that uh, that medsed report. And you know, I don't know if it if it helped anyone else, but knowing that that happened is still really very significant to me to know that some learnings and maybe someone somewhere was helped by what what happened to Gabriel. Gabriel died 17 years ago. It was in the same time that Hurricane Katrina was crashing into the Gulf. And it just made an incredibly unbelievable time just seem that much more unbelievable. And I'm doing pretty well since that happened. And the reason that I 
I am doing well is because while Gabriel was one of the unlucky millions, I am one of the un, I've, I'm one of the lucky few. And I'm lucky because I understand what happened to my son. I had people look me in the eye, explain, apologize, be accountable, and collaborate with me to try to make things better. And because I've done this work for a long time, I've had the opportunity to meet people who have had bad things happen to them at other hospitals who have not had the dignity of an explanation. And I will tell you, they are not doing well. It's, I think the ones who are doing as well as they can, they, they kind of have sort of like low grade fevers where they can, they can function, but they're never really going to thrive. And that, that lack of understanding is, carries a level of toxicity that I just don't think that we fully, that we really fully understand yet. I know that if, if any of us, you or me could go back and undo what happened to Gabriel, we absolutely would do that, but we can't. Unfortunately, none of us are that powerful and we are unable to change anything in the past. But we have a lot of power over how we respond to these kind of events. The hospital in Reno deliberately chose to ignore my calls and letters. And now still, all these years later, that still is really painful for me. But I think, but it's important that we dwell on what we can do, that after things go wrong, we are not powerless. We can choose to explain, learn, and engage with patients and families to improve healthcare for all of us. Six years after Gabriel died, I was invited to work with Stanford's risk management team on something that they called at the time the Pearl Process. Um, we have to have acronyms in healthcare or something cannot exist. I've, I've learned that. And in my role, I work between patients and families who have had things not go well with them and the hospital's uh, risk management and specifically claims team. And we work, we work to understand what the patients and families perspective is and do our very best to keep a bad event from getting any worse. We investigate, we explain, and we apologize. It's challenging and rewarding work, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do it. And I, I wanna make sure that everyone's aware of this, that there is, that risk has a team who is ready to help when something unexpected happens. And there's a risk management team that is very capable to help you. They're available um, during business hours at this number. You can also email them at riskmanagement at stanfordhealthcare.org. Um, I also include encourage you to file incidents, incident reports for serious safety events. And I'm guessing my colleagues, when you call them, are going to encourage you to do that as well. Um, I'll put this slide up at the end so you, you can make sure that you, you have the, this information. This is, this is a photo of my mom and Gabriel. This was taken about six months before he died. Um, you can probably imagine they were, they were quite close friends. So when I talk to you about working with risk management and patients and families, I don't, I don't want you to think, oh, there was an edict that all will be transparent and all will be disclosed. And then we ate cupcakes. That is not what happened. Um, being transparent when things go wrong is, is difficult. It requires us to be our very best selves, to be uncomfortable and to be vulnerable. But these discussions have power. I have seen guilt lifted from a mother's face and forgiveness handed to a doctor. And it, it's not that explaining and apologizing is only good for patients and families. It's also remarkably healing for patients and families. 
or excuse me, for physicians who were involved in these events. Um, we had a case where a young child died after a series of things going really poorly. And it took quite a while to understand exactly what happened. And we finally were able to have a meeting where we brought everyone together to explain what happened. And as the parents walked into the room, their their postures were slouched and it was like they were walking into a storm of just coming into that room was remarkably difficult. You could just see it by looking at their body language. But nonetheless, they came in and then the physician who was involved, she came in and sh her body was the same way, like she was walking into a wind. And the meeting was, was long and what happened was complex. And at one point, the father looked at the physician and said, you are the face of everything that went wrong that night. And she didn't argue. She didn't try to protect herself. She just listened with tears rolling down her cheeks. And then she had the opportunity to explain what she had been doing that night. The, the family was just in their room. They didn't see what was happening outside of their line of vision. And so she had the opportunity to explain what she had been doing. And then the dad said to her, I had no idea you were fighting so hard for her. And then she, the three of them, the mom, the father, and the physician all embraced. It was a profound privilege to be able to see and participate in that moment. And we had another, another case that we looked at where a patient died um, after an elective surgery and we reviewed it and planned the meeting. And I was concerned that the young physician who was going to be in that meeting maybe wouldn't be able to connect with that family very well. And that it would be, it would make a difficult thing, a family who's already grieving, that it would make it harder for them. But I was wrong about that. This young physician, he recognized that the fact that he was the last person to speak to their family member, that that really was an honor. And he told them about the conversation, how much he was looking forward to playing with his nephews. And it really was important for that family to hear. And they could see how difficult it was for this physician. And one of the patient's brothers said to the doctor, you have to let this go. We don't want this to hurt you anymore. Some things, some things don't have edges, so they can't be measured. They can't be quantified and put onto a dashboard. These are things like love, grief, sorrow, and hope. But for patients and their families, and probably for you, these are the things that matter most. This is, this is a photo of Gabriel that was taken at his, um, at his baptism that happened um, exactly three weeks from when his funeral would happen in the same place. And you know, I kind of always think, is he waving goodbye or is he waving hello? I'm not. I'm not really sure when I look at this photo. I'm confident that we all would like to think that what happened to Gabriel was rare, but we also all know that it's not. There's debate about the numbers, how many people die each year because of preventable errors. Some say the third, it's the third leading cause of death in the US. Others will say that that estimate is way too high. But I wonder at what number is it okay? Is it okay and acceptable if it's the fifth leading cause, the eighth leading cause, the 12th leading cause? I cannot find a word to accurately describe this situation, but we need everyone's help. By being honest and transparent, we can engage the most motivated and underutilized resource in healthcare patients and their families. You can give them the opportunity 
to find value in their experiences the way that Stanford has done for me. And the importance of this, it just simply cannot be measured. Thank you very much. Um, again, here's, here's the numbers and the email that I wanna be sure that everyone has in case, you, in case you need it. Hopefully you never will, but if you ever do, I want you to know that these, these resources are available for you. Thank you, Leilani. That was such a powerful presentation and took a lot from it and learned a lot from it. And what a powerful story for all of us to hear. Um, we'd like to you. welcome, I'd like to open it up for any questions, comments. Um, I think it would be great to hear uh, just a brief description of like what the process would be when you do contact the risk management advisory team. So you you won't you won't speak to me. You'll speak to one of my colleagues who are part of the uh, risk management team, the clinical risk management team. Um, I've never been the person who answers those calls. But I will tell you, they would want to understand what happened. Um, they'll want to understand your perspective and they will guide you from there. Um, not everything that doesn't turn out well, and this is not news to any of you, but not everything that doesn't turn out well is going to rise to the level of us um, investigating it. Um, we're really careful about which cases we choose to do this with. We do it really thoughtfully. We engage leadership in part of, um, are really a significant part of understanding what happened and part of the decision of how we're going to move forward. So we don't do any of this lightly at all. Um, and it takes, it takes a long time to fully understand. Um, in my discussions with families, that's one thing I say to them is I say, you know, it's going to take too long and you're probably going to get frustrated and please reach out to me when you have questions. Um, so I can't, I can't tell you exactly what is going to happen when you call, but you're going to have people who, who are there to help you. Um, and I just encourage you to take advantage of, of these resources that are available. Question, Sam. Um, yes, go thank ahead, you, Katie. Thank you so much, Leilani. I really, really appreciate um, your sharing your story. And I was like one-handed typing um, when you were talking about the process that was helpful. So explain, apologize, and collaborate for a solution is what I wrote down. I'm thinking about the situations that don't rise to the level of risk management that this kind of framework could be really helpful for. And I just wanna make sure that I'm not missing anything or if you, know, if you have more detail that, that is useful to share about that actual conversation and, and what best practices are, I'd, I'd really love to hear it. Well, I think people want to be heard. They want, they want their experiences to be, um... I don't know, validated, maybe they want to be, they want to be understood. And I think they want to contribute towards making things better. Um, again, not everyone's experience could have been preventable, but for every patient, their, their perspective is their reality. And so it, I think though, sometimes it's difficult. I won't, I won't say it. These are easy conversations by any means, but there really is a lot of value in people being able to share their experience and talk about it in a way that it is not necessarily accepted as fact, but accepted as their own truth. So, you know, it's, it's tricky when an event first happens and I'm, I'm going to call and introduce myself to these patients and families where oftentimes we don't know exactly what happened. There's oftentimes we, we need time to review, but we don't want to wait 
to understand the patient's and the family's perspective. So I will say something like, I'm so sorry for the way your life has changed in the last couple of days, which is just that, I mean, it's just true. I am, I am very sorry about how that changed. And I'm not, I'm not saying that there's, that I'm responsible or that I know that it, there is, there is responsibility anywhere, but I just want to convey that what has happened to them matters to us. And, and that I think, I think that's something that's really valuable because sometimes we will have have cases that after they've been reviewed, it will be determined that it was not preventable, that it was bad luck for lack of another term. And, and because we've been having conversations with the patient and the family, they are more likely to trust us when we have the opportunity to fully explain and I, I think that, that that helps the institution um, by giving us the opportunity for patients and families to understand something. Um, and it helps them because then they're not going to feel like they need to keep fighting to understand or go to litigation to understand. So just having, having that... Um, just the framework of a conversation to rebuild trust is valuable to, to everybody. Thank you for that question, Katie. Um, and along with the patients who are seeking out answers, um, who are those patients? How do those patients engage from their side um, in this process? Um, like, can a patient initiate something that's on the risk management team's radar? So we we encourage, sometimes that happens. Um, it's been a while, but sometimes I have even had patients call my personal cell phone uh, but that's that has not happened for quite a while, and we don't really encourage it. What we would want to do is have them work through patient relations and patient experience to understand what happened through there. Um, our review is really more designed for adverse events that are reported through um, staff and faculty. So not necessarily initiated by patients and families. We certainly aren't going to ignore them by, by any means, but we do rely on our colleagues in um, guest services and patient relations to help us to help us understand these events before we really get committed and dig into fully understanding what's happened. Uh, Lydia, uh... You would put a comment in the chat, and if you have the ability, can do you want to ask it out loud? Yeah, thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Leilani, also for sharing your story. Um, try not to tear up um, as you were okay. describing um, your personal story. It's very impactful, and thank you for sharing that with us. Um, easily, we forget about um, people when we are looking at data. So, so thank you for bringing that to light. Um, my question was just centered, I think you sort of described it a little bit about um, conversations that, that the patient has, um, you know, if they're having, or, or I guess, um, you know, they can maybe go to guest services to have um, their commentary heard, like if they don't feel confident to call up a staff member that they're doing something that maybe is not the right process to complete. So instead of contacting uh, risk management, what are some ways um, that patients can kind of feel confident to, I guess, call out staff, call out nurses or physicians um, to make sure that their voices are being heard? Um, that's, that's, that's tough. I guess, I think, I think it would be helpful if 
And this is this is a more holistic, not maybe not the granular kind of uh, response that you're looking for. But I think it would be helpful if we were mindful of the fact that we all are part of a profoundly complicated system, that patients and families are part of that as much as physicians and staff are part of it. Um, <laughs> it's going to be cliche, but be nice. Like be vigilant and be nice, be kind to everyone. You know, I will, I'll have complete strangers reach out to me and say, I'm trying to connect with the hospital where something happened completely separate from Stanford. And they'll ask me, what, what can I do? And the first thing I say is assume positive intent. Do not, do not respond that you think anyone is trying to make things difficult for you. Um, so I I don't know I that's that's hard for me to answer because quite frankly I spent very little time in the hospital. Um Gabriel got sick on a Thursday and was dead on a Tuesday, so I have very little experience knock on wood uh being hospitalized where I can really um offer much guidance to to families who find themselves in that situation. I'm sorry I'm not more more specific. Thank you. I think that that's a really great answer is to be kind and feel, you know, patients should also feel um, like they're being heard. Uh, I, I brought up that situation because I also had a negative experience. And before things became precarious, I felt confident as a healthcare employee mm. to um, go to the right people and make a change, hopefully, before other people who don't have the ability to call out. Um, staff members who are mistreating their patients. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, thank you for sharing that. Be kind is the message. <laughs> Any other questions or Lilani, do you have uh, questions for this group? Um. Yeah, I guess I would be, I'm interested in, you know, I, I'm talking to you about sort of about the best case scenario of everything is explained and, and those answers are helpful and we're able to make thing make improvements and, and really take us something terrible and, and stop it from becoming worse. But I'm I'm not in I'm not in the weeds the way that I think probably most of the people on this call are. And so it's it's kind of easy for me to give the the oh just be kind and tell the truth and everything's going to be fine and I'm not that naive. So I guess I'm would just be interested in understanding what are what some reluctance um or if there's any reluctance about an approach of of explaining and i mean i don't entirely expect everyone to be completely feel comfortable in in bearing their soul that way but i am just curious of knowing what are maybe some some reasons why it doesn't happen um i have my own theories but i i would just appreciate understanding more if anyone would be willing to share what some of their apprehension would be around this approach And I'm I'm gonna jump in. Sam had texted me that her um, electricity has just gone out. Oh. So uh, hi, Leilani. I'm super happy to be facilitating now. <laughs> I'm Katie. Um, I'm Katie. And I see we've got a hand raised. Um, Blaze Bush, do you want to chime in? Yes. Um, thank you so much, and thank you, Leilani. What a absolutely impactful, powerful. Um, heart touching talk. Thank you for being so vulnerable to share your story here. Um, so I have, you've cultivated a lot of thoughts in my head. So I'm going to narrow it down to maybe two things and try to answer your question at the same time. Okay. Um, but my role is the executive director for the LGBTQ plus health program. And so um, I hear about a lot of cases of, of negative, negative experiences. Um, 
that impact healthcare, maybe not on the side of, um, you know, some of the stories that I've heard today, uh, where, you know, maybe equipment or decisions were made where there was a loss of life, but sometimes more on those pieces of, um, you know, oppression, um, transphobia, um, homophobia that can come up. Um, and so my, my one answer to your question is, you know, I think, especially in cases like these, it can be really hard for an individual or an institution to own that these played a part of it. And, mm -hmm. and, and when you have to own and explain that maybe there is a piece of any of these diversity, equity, and inclusion pieces that came up where an employee made decisions, maybe that came from a place of bias or, or lack of education. Um, so to your question, that was on my mind of like, certainly I've, I've seen some real careful handling and lack of transparency when it comes down to these pieces. Mm -hmm. And along that line, you know, a lot of what you also said in your personal story. So another hat I wear is restorative justice and restorative, your story is very restorative in some ways in that, um, well, there was a harm that couldn't be we couldn't go back in time and change things. Um, but how do you repair that as best as possible? And I heard you talk about clear transparency and even trying to change the system, like transform the knowledge that was out there so it was prevented from, from happening again, really change things. <clears throat> and so a lot of what I was thinking about as you were talking was, you know, for my community, you know, what do you do if it's hard for somebody to engage, you know, if they experience transphobia and then you know, like just fall over, like the tree fall over, what that? Oh, I don't know if that was for us or not. Carry on. Okay. Um, the, the, you know, the re-traumatization of somebody maybe coming back to that conversation. I was interested in your, your thoughts around how do you handle that? You know, if somebody just feels like I can't keep approaching this, even if I get transparency, you know, maybe I want to receive that, but I can't step forward and, and, and keep engaging with this in some way. And so how do you outline those, those options? And then in other ways, like how could we do more in our system to uplift that side though too for those people who did want to share you know like i keep getting these cases of people people being misgendered again and again and again you know could repair look like having them create their own educational piece where they talk about that experience and, and we use that to educate people how to do differently and so that's kind of where my mind's gone on this and would love your thoughts on all of that that idea about re-traumatizing people um so it's a really good one. And I also, I know that 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 can be used as kind of an excuse not to engage with people of, oh, well, we don't, we don't want to upset anyone. They haven't called us. Let's, let's not rock the boat. And fortunately we don't, we don't take that approach. We, we engage with patients and families. Um, it's important to me to recognize that the way a, a family member or a patient feels about an event is probably not the way they're going to feel about it forever. So um, it, we'll, we'll have, sometimes it'll take patients and families a really long time to connect with me. Um, they're very reluctant to return my calls. This is particularly true around kids who have died, like those are very, very different call, difficult calls for families to make to me. Um, and I, I'm really try to be really cognizant of that, but it's important that they know that they can reach out to me on when they are ready. So I will say things like, I'm gonna call you every two weeks to check on you, and you don't have to call me back unless something, I need your help with something, then I'm going to say, yes, then I need you to call me back. I mean, we can't force people to participate in these programs. Um, we can be as straightforward and honest about what it all means, but we can't, we can't make anybody do it. Um, and so it's, it's quite important to us that, that from the outset, they understand 
what is going to happen. And we, we work really hard to set expectations for people so that they can choose whether they want to participate or not. And I mean, some people just, they don't ever want to talk to us again. It's quite rare. Um, but I feel that it is important that even if nine months from now, they feel like they're ready, then they're ready and they can call us. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I just think that it's important to recognize that how people move through these events is fluid and changes and that we should give them the opportunity to ask questions when they're, when they're ready to do that. And I mean, the other part of your question is the, is essentially the power of stories, right? Like if you, if the people who are coming to you had the opportunity to share, well, this is what happened to me. We can't walk in each other's shoes. We just can't do it, but we can, we can understand each other's stories. If, if we have the opportunity to hear them, like, I mean, like me today, you know, but that's, it's really, it's really important and significant to me that I have the opportunity to share the most pivotal event of my life with, with all of you like that, that in itself is really powerful. Thank you so much, Leilani. I just want to, so I'm a qualitative researcher um, with the evaluation sciences unit. I'm always excited when people talk about the value of stories. And I think this is a, an, an angle that we don't think about all the time. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I wanted to say, and I wonder if Ed um, Guzman wants to jump in. Ed had put in the chat um, that doing what we say regarding follow-up is important in vulnerable times. And I just in particular um, love your setting expectations. I'm gonna call you that there's not anything that they need to do. And also that there are going to be ways for them to be in touch with you. I'm going to call you every two weeks. You don't have to talk to me, you know, for, for very long. Um, those are some of the principles uh, of like trauma-informed communication and trauma-informed care. Um, and so that's, that's just a comment um, there. Ed, did you want to chime in or I'm not sure that they're still here actually. Yeah, sorry about that. I was uh, double muted there. But yeah, I, I, I think even taking taking these situations, um, reflecting as, as a manager and, you know, th throughout the time, you know, you have team members that have family members that, that pass away. And just as, as a organizational leader, uh, you know, scheduling those times, like, okay, you know, we'll check in, you know, in a couple days, We'll assess, we'll, you know, we're here to support, give you, the, you know, yeah, give, give you the, the time that you need to heal. Um, but then that, that follow-up definitely is important to let them know that they're, they're supported throughout the, um, throughout those times. Yeah. Unfortunately, these things aren't, aren't isolated for the people who experience them, right? It, it, it sticks with us for a really long time. Well, thank you so much, Leilani, for coming to join us. Um, just in terms of uh, a, a researcher's perspective, um, having talked to lots of physicians um, uh, on your question about what may get in the way of, of these conversations, um, I talk with Kelly Skeff um, a lot about um, the the pipeline of physicians um, and that you know throughout medical education, even to get to medical school in the first place, you really have to be right. Um, and you, uh oh, did you guys freeze? No, you're still there. Okay, good. Sorry, it's super windy where I am. And so I'm, I'm and with, with Sam's electricity going out, I'm kind of, um, yeah, just waiting for the, waiting for the other limb to drop. Um, anyway, but there, there's, a, a, there's a real pressure to be right. Um, and that pressure um, extends um, into medical practice, and um, uh, there there are points where it's 
super critically useful and then other points where like this where it may get in the way um i don't have any solutions with respect to that but just um that that it's uh it's it, it may be quite deep seated within medicine well no one wants to think that they've hurt someone else and that that's that's really a difficult place to be in um and again i mean it's easy for me to say this is what you all should do um without i'm i'm haven't been on the other side um but i i just i've seen how transformative it can be for everyone involved when an understanding can be reached an understanding of what the event has meant for the patient and the family and then also what it what it's meant for the providers um it's it's really it's really important to find that common ground and i think most of the time people want to find themselves there um if they're just supported and given the opportunity to do that well i i so appreciate your um your presentation um i didn't really know what to expect coming in today and i um i just found this very meaningful. Um, so uh, if you're where you can unmute um, and give Leilani a round of applause, um, please do. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Selena, I want to make sure that uh, do we have any announcements for SMCI? No new announcements. Great. Well, we will see you all again um, in our in our next um, symposium. Thank you again, Leilani. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you.